This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Hello and welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program here in America that you, the viewer, can tell your story on CPS and voice your opinion on the child welfare system. I'm Dennis Lawrence and beside me is Maria Mullen. Maria, we're going to go back to July 27th at a rally and show a couple clips today of that. Uh, this was put, put on by Adina Carl in Alexandria Cervantes. I want to thank those two ladies for such a good job at this rally. Maria? I personally had a great time, Dennis, with um, the girls who put this on as well as, you know, fellowshipping and just talking to like-minded individuals who have been in the corruption in the family courts and child welfare system. Up first, we have Jamie Venser. Jamie had her children taken for medical neglect. CPS never checked for any brittle bone disease, which is what she claims she has. Let's go to the Capitol on in Lansing. Who is facing charges for something the man didn't do just because he was in the Marine Corps? It's my one-year-old Zeta. Zeta stands for the lucky one. I was told I can never have kids. Never. I lost my chances when I lost my right ovary. My husband did everything in his power to make sure we had Zeta. And I am so grateful for this little girl every day. But what breaks my heart the most so our second one came a lot easier than what we had anticipated. She, of course, was not planned, but that doesn't mean we don't love her just as much as Zeta. This is my almost six month old. Her name is Adeline. Her name stands for noble, and that she is. She's very noble. They took her when she was almost two months old. The day she was born, I complained, and I complained. I took her to her family doctor. I took her to Oakland Hospital in Marshall, and they told me she's consolable. Go home. If she develops a fever, bring her back. I couldn't touch my daughter's legs or change her diaper without her screaming like somebody was murdering her, and it hurt me so bad not knowing what was wrong with her. And then I discovered we have a vitamin deficiency. We have rickets and we have signs of Ellis Danlos syndrome. A CPS and our family court judge has denied all of our requests to get this little girl medical testing. They have dropped them off at my sister's home. They promised her we'd start your foster care license. They haven't done that yet. My sister has had my children almost three months. Because she doesn't have that foster license, she cannot get my children tested. What hurts me the most is three times a week, an hour each day, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I have to undig Zeta's claws from out of my back because she's crying because she can't come home with her mommy. And now my six month old is starting to do the same thing when I have to put her in a stranger's van three times a week. Now they're worried about my daughter's development. 
when they took Zeta, Zeta knew sign language. Not even two yet, new sign language. She can't do that now. She doesn't recognize it. What breaks my heart even more is that their father, their biological father, can't even touch them, can't talk to them, can't kiss them, nothing. Man served four years in the Marine Corps in a different country for their families to have all the freedoms and liberties in the world just to come home for them to rip his two beautiful little girls out of his arms. They physically took my daughter out of his arms after I took her to a well child checkup. Still complaining of the same thing. He sent us to Bronson Southwest. They never used an infant board when they did x-rays. But I had a prior CPS case that was open and for it to be closed, I had to take her to an emergency room, Adeline here. I had to take Adeline to an emergency room and have her fully checked out. When we got to Borges Hospital in Kalamazoo, it took five people to hold down, not even a full two month old, five people to hold my baby down to give her a catheter. Then it took three more people to hold her down to take blood from her. The x-ray technician didn't strap her down either. Grabbed her by her ribs while her head flopped to her chest. On April 11th, the reason why they took my children is because the allegations were Adeline had multiple fractures in different healing stages. 16 fractures in the ribs, one leg fracture, one arm fracture, and two skull fractures. And they refuse to enter Borges Hospital medical records into court. They refuse to even take one glimpse at Borges Hospital to see if they may have been the cause of my child's injuries. And you know what? I lost my family because the day after the state cop had questioned us. I had to sign my husband into the veterans hospital for being suicidal. And I didn't know he was suicidal and he became suicidal because they took his little girl physically out of his arms. I lost my family. And I'm here because not only am I trying to be my daughter's voice because CPS told me her voice doesn't matter. She doesn't have a voice. And I'm telling you right now, she may be six months old, but she does have a voice. Every child has a voice. They may not be able to use it, but we can. And I just want to make sure, I, I would like, I don't know where I would start, but if somebody can help me, I would like to, to, to try to get two laws proposed in the state of Michigan. The first one, I believe every parent that is a strong parent and that wants to fight for their child should have that right to do so. Michigan is not a state that allows parents to fight to get their parental rights back. Every parent deserves their day. And I believe the strong ones that are, are dedicated will make it to the end. The weak ones will phase out before them. But the ones that make it to the end, they deserve their kids. They deserve their life, their soul. This is my heartbeat. When they took my children, they basically signed my death warrant. If they end my parental rights, I have no reason to live. None, and I love my husband to death. But you know what? My children have more love than any human that walks this earth. The second law I would like to try to get into this state, I would like to name it Addie's Law. Any child that is taken from their parent with any type of broken bone or the parent has any type of concern of any type of medical problem, I don't care if they have a sneeze, it should be state mandatory that they get the medical testing that they deserve as an American citizen. That's what my husband fought for. Just because they're under 18, that doesn't mean that they don't have rights, along with any other child that has been taken. And I just want to help everyone. I want to I want to reach out to everyone because if I can help one person, then I did my job. If one person can help me, they're not helping me. I'm not here for me. I'm not here for my husband. I'm here for my little girl. 
who I don't know. And my other little girl, who I have to cry and rip away from me and say, I'm sorry, you can't come home with mommy. No child and no mother should feel that pain. None. So I, was, I hope everybody achieves their, their goal. And that's your children. Thank you. Medical neglect, we are hearing stories every day on this. Uh, there, of course, has been Justina Politer case that made national headlines, but here in Michigan, you know, I, I think in the last year I've had about four, four or five phone calls on this. Uh, and, um, you know, one that hits pretty close is uh, from Grand Haven, Michigan, a Sarah Wagaski uh, Heisinger who won her um, case. Yeah, Maria, you were a little bit close to this woman. Um, you have anything to say about medical neglect and how this is handled by CPS? Well, Dennis, I happen to know Sarah um, personally long before any of the travesties happened with her family. We worked close together. Um, she worked with the missing, which a lot of times in domestic violence, we have women who come up missing only to find out that they're murdered by, you know, murdered by spouses. Um, so I knew her long before any of this took place. She had a really tough fight on her hand and they did win, but they spent their entire life savings just to keep their children with them as well as lost their son um, in a really tragic accident in Grand Haven, Michigan. And I think in this case, uh, you know, certainly if they hadn't had a proper attorney that was a go-getter and a fighter that uh, this probably would have ended up where they didn't see their child again. So, uh, you know, um, CPS, instead of proving families innocent and getting to the bottom of the allegations, they find that it is easier to prove a parent unfit the way the present laws are written. And uh, we're seeing that all the time. Uh, if you have a proper attorney, if you have a go-getter, go-getter of an attorney, you're going to, you know, I would say nine out of ten chances you're going to win that case. And uh, this attorney that uh, they had certainly was a go-getter and uh, proved them innocent, although they lost all their life savings. Of course, savings that could have been used on raising a family. So. Uh, next up, uh, we're going to go back to the 27th rally, uh, and this this story here uh, made headlines in Michigan. Uh, it's a medical marijuana story. Uh, you heard of Baby Bree? Well, here is her, here is her mother, Maria Green. I'm Maria Green, and um, this is Baby Bree. And I don't know um, how many of you are aware of our story from last year. Um, I'm the founder of the Free Bree Foundation. Um, Bree was taken at six months old, was forced to stop her breastfeeding, um, and just ripped out of my arms. And we had to fight for six weeks. We finally got her back. And um, the whole thing was over whether or not I was allowed to use the medicine that the doctors said I should use. And that's it. And so, um, you know, the biggest problem that I see in the CPS system is that if any other person violated a law or ignored a law in order to take a child, they would be prosecuted with kidnapping. And that's what these judges are doing. They are violating laws and ignoring them in order to take children away. They're not charged with kidnapping. In fact, they can't even be sued for it. They have immunity. So they don't care. They just continue kidnapping our children 
because there is no consequences for them. And so we need to come together and stop judicial immunity, make them accountable to their actions. And um, I just wanna encourage everybody, keep an eye on the bills that are coming through the House and the Senate. Um, there's one right now that talks about uh, videotaping, mandatory videotaping for children who are uh, interviewed by a CPS worker that needs to go through and in fact that needs That's to right. be expanded. Um, and also I just want to let you guys know um, part of my Free Brief Foundation is that I started a uh, event every Mother's Day because I was really um, at Mother's Day this year, I, I was still missing my son, who's uh, seven now, and I was really having a hard time emotionally with Mother's Day coming up, knowing that I wasn't gonna have my baby with me. And so, um, so I started an event um, called Up, Up and a Love, and we get balloons, we write messages to our children who are not with us on Mother's Day and we let them go in balloons. And it, it's kind of, I mean, obviously our kids are never going to actually get those messages in person, but I believe that, you know, if we send our messages of love in those balloons to them on Mother's Day, they know it and they can feel it in their hearts. So I um, encourage you to uh, find us on Facebook and um, learn about that event for next year. We may have expanded it to Father's Day next year as well. So, you wanna say anything? <laughs> I love mommy. I love mommy. Uh, thank you, everyone. If you live in the Grand Rapids area, you may have heard about the trailer fire that took place two weeks ago in, in Allegan County, Michigan. It was actually in Door, Michigan. Um, what had happened is there was a house fire that really grabbed the news and that was you know, brought into the news. Um, come to find out afterwards and the next day, we found out that Deborah, Deborah Shepard was shot and killed by her husband, as well as her, I'm sorry, it might have been boyfriend, as well as her two children, Emma McConer, McComer and Corey Lavalley. Now, Corey Lavalley Sr. had apparently shot and killed these, you know, this mom and her two daughters, and then set the trailer on fire to get rid of any evidence that may have been left behind. Um, one of the things about this story is I really don't believe that this story would have made the news as it did had they known it was a murder um, and that there was domestic violence involved. One of the reasons why this story is so, it hits so close to home with me is when I went up against Kevin Crone and the judge, um, well, when you fight with a judge, you go to jail and, and not for committing a crime, but I was put in jail several times for contempt of court. Um, one time I was jailed 21 days for smoking a cigarette. The next time, when CPS told me to keep my son for his own safety, I followed their direction because I knew that I would probably go to jail, but I also knew if I went up against CPS, I could lose all rights and visitation to my children. So I chose what I did based on my educated opinion. While I was in jail, Dennis, one of the things you know, I met a lot of people, and there was some in there that had dealt with domestic violence. Of course, they knew what I do and what I was in there for. Um, Deborah Shepard was one of these women that I was in, I was in jail with, and she was there because she had been in abuse, and she was defending herself when they had. Um, then the judge decided to jail them both rather than to see it as the abuse it was. This woman suffered under abuse from Corey Lavalley, who is now being held for the triple homicide. And it has been now charged with at least one murder that I'm aware of. Instead of helping this woman get out of the situation, 
they put them both in jail. Now, this did not help to protect the mom or her kids. And now they're all dead. I, I can't remember the father's first name, the other father's first name, but he was fighting for his daughter, Emma, because he knew of the abuse going on. He was unable to get the attention of anybody for assistance in this case. And now he has a dead daughter as well as, you know, he was close to her other son, which was the son of Corey Lavallee, the one who's charged. My point in this whole thing is that these children were not protected the way they should have been. There's nothing that any other family or anybody can do now for them because they're all deceased. They were all murdered. How many children is it going to take for these kids to die before we sit up and take notice that this is an epidemic in our country? This is not something that's going to go away. Not with these children being in the homes of abusers. Not only is it not going to go away, it's only going to serve to get worse. We'll be back after this message. Okay, right now I'd like to shift gears and go to the Baby LK video that takes a look at the top 10 greatest lawsuits. Good evening. Tonight's category Baby LK's top 10 favorite lawsuits against the child protective industry of all time. Number 10. In September of 2007, a 12-year-old girl was awarded $788,000 from the state of Florida. This after being molested by a child protective investigator named Lewis Templeton when she was 5. Then in April of the following year, the state of Florida files its own lawsuit in an attempt to get out of pain. Number 9. In January of 2010, the parents of the child who was raped by a foster child they took in settles for $775,000. This because the Office of Children and Youth in Erie County, Pennsylvania places a sexually abusive child in their home without warning them of his past. Number 8. The mother of Tyler and Ariana Payne settles for $1 million. This because the Arizona CPS sent them to their doom. Their father, Christopher Payne, was later sentenced to death for starving them. 
Number 7. In 2007, a mentally retarded 15-year-old who was impregnated by her foster father wins a settlement of $1.2 million. Of course, pending an act of the legislature, Florida held that up too. Number 6. In March of 2010, 11 kids who were forced to sleep in cages by their foster parents reached a $1.2 million settlement with a county in Ohio. Lawyers for the children claimed that social workers missed several red flags that should have indicated the children were in danger sooner. The foster parents argued that the kids were special needs and this was necessary for the safety of themselves and the other kids in the home. And get this, prior to their conviction for felony child abuse and endangerment, these idiots tried to reach a compromise with the state to get the kids back. Number 5. An Alaskan boy is awarded $1.5 million in a failure to protect case after workers ignored several abuse complaints. Number 4. In Washington, two women win a $2 million settlement based on the claim that they were sexually abused in a foster home when they were five. These allegations were never proven and the foster parents were never criminally charged. <coughs> Number 3. Also in Washington, $6 million was awarded in the Tyler DeLeon case. Carol DeLeon tortured and starved several children in two states and Tyler DeLeon died just before his seventh birthday weighing only 28 pounds. In March of 2010, Carol DeLeon walked out of prison after serving three years of a six-year sentence. <coughs> Number 2. Eight children in Washington win a $10.5 million settlement for being placed with a foster molester who is now doing a 26-year jail sentence. And the number one top 10 lawsuits against the child protective industry of all time is Marissa Amora, who suffered permanent brain damage while in foster home, wins a $26.7 million settlement from the state of Florida. Of course, in keeping with Florida's history of non-payment, the girl has yet to receive her money. For these stories and all the latest dirt on the child protective industry, visit www.legallykidnapped.com. And until next time, this is Baby LK, over and out. If you would like to be a guest on Silent Voices, contact us at miparentalrights at gmail.com. That's miparentalrights at gmail.com. I want to thank you for watching today. You can catch us next week, same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends, remember, your voice can make the difference. difference.